So I'm Professor Rahul Mangaram, and um, so we have uh, five faculty that work with the Embedded Systems Master's program, and uh, the stuff that we do in this lab is a lot on the system side of things. So essentially, the focus of this lab is on the topic of cyber physical systems, and uh, this is really like the next generation of embedded systems of how it scales, how it actually works. Uh, in a lot of very critical, like safety critical and time critical systems. And um, so the cyber physical part really, I don't know if you all were introduced to that yet or no, right? Give me a sign. OK, no. OK, so, so cyber physical really means that we have the cyber part, which you all are familiar with, is the computation and the communication that we are all building in the computer departments of our universities. But the physical part is really the messy part. It's like how can we get these devices to have close coupled control and interfacing with the physical world? So like, you know, medical devices, that's what we work with over here. So these are like pacemakers and cardiac defibrillators. So they are devices that are implanted in our body. But unlike um, how we have the Toyota car recall, these devices also get recalled. And in the last 10 years, these devices were recalled 600,000 devices were recalled. And the interesting part is, but it's not interesting to us, but it's quite a bad news is that 40% of those 600,000 or about 200,000 of those were recalled due to firmware bugs, software problems in, in the devices, right? So now imagine that you can get your Toyota car recalled and you can just leave it at the dealership, they'll fix it for you. But if this device is recalled, they got to take it out of your body and put in something else, right? So so what we are really focused on over here is, you know, in one, this is one of the domains that we work on, is how do we build like safety critical and time critical devices like this, um, so that we can certify the software is safe, right? Can we put a stamp on the software and say, this module is safe, you can use it. Uh, but it's not so simple, because, so what the FDA does today is they just test and they just test, and testing is never enough because the human body can go into all these different states. So in this lab, what we work on is like we work on distributed real-time systems. We work on the protocols. We do the modeling and the virtualization of these platforms. And we also build the actual systems, right? So I'll pass out a couple of these. Uh, so these are our wireless sensor nodes. So they are like microcontroller-based uh, sensor nodes. And they are all run a real-time operating system. Yeah, I can pass that around. And and I have one charging up over here, which uh, runs, they are so low power, they run on a solar panel, right? But it's a full operating, real-time operating system running on this. So you can take a look at this. So this is what a lot of the, cl the classes that we teach, each group gets a little box, and then they build you know, networks and systems. You'll learn to program how to use these in creative ways. And it doesn't matter if you're a robo, you're CIS, you're you know, whatever master's program you're in. So this is actually one of the quad rotors just uh, this last semester, the undergraduates built in, in a one month long project, right? So they built the system, they came up with the chassis, they came up with how much, you know, lift they need and the whole design and they made it wireless, like teleoperated over here and they come up with the control system of how to manage the bot, right? So, so that's kind of an example project that we have here. So what we'll do is we have quite a few demos that we have set up for y'all to really see because whatever we, the theory we do, we really like to build something so we can touch and feel and really believe that it works. Um, so what I'll have is I'll, each of the students over here will go through and we'll give you a little short tour of what's going on. And then we can, you know, you can ask your questions. And I'll play some videos for y'all once we iterate through. So. That's how over here and Allison is hiding there. So they work on medical devices, and then we have like Amin Reza. He works on automotive, you know, and parallel computing like GPU programming. Um, and then we have Mansi over here. He works on industrial control with other, you know, students in the group. And then we have, you know, um, so we work on a variety of projects, and they interface with companies like Honeywell for industrial control. So our goal over there is how do we make uh, we have all these factories that exist, like oil refineries and paper pulp, and they sound boring, but that's really what you know the infrastructure of the nation is based on. 
And what we are looking at is how do we replace all the programmable controllers with wireless, right? So everything that we work on has some element of wireless. So I'll let Hao explain to you what's going on over here. We have this real pacemaker setup, and then we can go through some other demos. So, okay, so, um, so here we borrowed uh, the patient simulator and uh, the pacemaker programmer from uh, Medtronic. So the patient simulator can generate the surface uh, ECG signals and also the uh, intracardio electrograms uh, which is the uh, electro uh, signal in inside your heart, and uh, these signals are fit into the real uh, pacemakers like this, and then we can see the uh, see the uh, see the, uh, si the the signals on the programmer, and we can adjust all the parameters to uh, simulate different scenarios to simulate those scenario for different pa uh, pacemaker modes, and over here. <coughs> So just like Professor Mangoram said, we uh, it is very important to test those devices in a closed loop manner. So um, in order to do that, we made a, a we developed a, a heart model by uh, simulating the uh, electrical conduction system of the heart using timed automata, and we generated uh, different uh, cli clinical relevant cases. Uh, by generating different the the, uh, uh, the electrogram signal for the different clinical cases, and we also uh, implement uh, our heart model onto the uh, onto hardware which is uh, which has a uh, FPGA on it, and we also implement a basic uh, pacemaker model onto this onto this small small module, and we can. Uh, validate the pacemaker functions in a closed loop manner, and we can see here the this is the uh, user interface for that. So in this case, we can validate the pacemaker, the basic pacemaker, pacemaker functions. And uh, after this, since the uh, pacemaker model and the heart model are also developed in the uh, time using time automata, we can do some fo formal verification for the pacemaker software to formally verify if the, the software is doing uh, what the specification told, to, told it to do. So, yeah, that's it. So, Willie, you want to show your stuff? <coughs> sure. So, so um, I'll show it on the screen that you can see. Uh, so, I've been working on this small patch. Um, this is an electrocardiogram patch. It's supposed to take um, the signal right from the chest. It's, uh, it's going to digitize it, and it, but we can actually send it uh, wirelessly to a cell phone, uh, cell phone device, which is a PDA. The idea is that we, um, we're targeting a very small, uh, um, low-profile device and very low power. Um, so, well, right now we have uh, this um, just prototype, functional prototype, which is um, fairly small size and um, it it actually uh, it, it can actually get the signal um, out of this uh, simulator. This is a patient simulator is going to give you a very small signal. Um, it's, it's simulating the uh, an ECG signal from your chest. So we can actually get that. Uh, we actually divided this project in many different parts, like the signal processing, um, the wireless communication, um, and and the iPhone app. So. That's so all that on the medical side of things. And you have the blinds or not? Uh, no. Okay. So, so you'll see also the blinds that Willie has powered them with, you know, that he can control everything with his iPhone over there. So, yeah. So, so the other thing that we work <coughs> on is uh, also on factory automation. So this is like uh, we have uh, these little sensor nodes, but we've made that, that blue box over there is a little factory module. So we can put a wooden block in, and then it goes onto a, a work cell, and then it gets drilled and cut and everything like that. But the whole module over here has 22 sensors and actuators, and everything is controlled by one of the Firefly nodes that I sent you, that I passed around. And um, so our goal over here is to sort of build uh, architectures, algorithms, and communication protocols for the future of wireless automation. Because this will save automation companies about 30% in the initial cost and about 60% in the time to set up a new plant. 
And so these are really you know, very critical operations. And what we have to take care of is that, well, wireless is going to keep dropping packets. That shouldn't make the oil refinery blow up or you know, something crazy like that, right? And they come after me or him. Uh, so that's, that's why we have master students. So, uh, so, so this is a case where you know, the factory is running, and then you know, we shut off the primary controller node. So that's the plant. And now this is a backup node, and the backup node is really talking and sensing to, with all the sensors and actuators. And then it figures out, OK, something is wrong. And now this will become the primary. And you'll see the light come on over here. And the orange light comes on, and then the factory continues running. So what we are really trying to sort of work on is different wireless control applications. So we are really combining you know, scheduling, uh, embedded systems, controls, all into one. So for example, when you studied in, or, and when I studied in, in high school or middle school, everything we studied was physics, chemistry, biology, and they are different subjects. And you know, that's how the, but the real world is all mixed up, right? So all the new labs that are coming up here, like there's a nano bio lab, right? So it's material science, bio, and you know, other sort of electronics all mixed up. And so that building is just going to break ground in a couple of months. And that'll be, you know, it's ninety dollar for the building, uh, ninety million dollars for the building, and and about hundred million just for the equipment that goes in, right? So one microscope there costs seven million. So we are very aggressive on that side. So another topic, I'll shift gears a lot now, uh, literally speaking, to automotive systems. So over here we have like cars driving around, and you know the cars are communicating. So each of these cars has a little box that can communicate over because. Just as we have Wi-Fi in the buildings, the automotive companies were given 75 megahertz for safety and other communication between cars. So what we've built is a simulator that can have real cars and virtual cars so that we can build new protocols for vehicles to communicate. And why do we need this? Suppose there's an accident, then that car's airbag deploys, and that issues a warning or an alert message, and that goes down the highway. Right, so and then everyone else gets a beep and they wake up and they hit the brakes much earlier, or other things like you go to a gas station, you want to fill up gas, and then this will get let you download movies straight away for the kids in the back seat, and you know. So I'll prefer you know Exxon over you know Valero or some other gas station, right? So, but it's a lot of applications. We are not so concerned about the apps themselves. That's what the companies do. We are really focused on how do we build the platform, the electronics, the future, right? So something that is six to eight years out. And so it's always like we're working with something that's way out, quite crazy, and everyone looks at you if you go to a cocktail party and we're like, you're weird, you know? And, but that's a good response, actually, because we are you know, a little bit out, or out there right in R. So let me see if I can restart this. So this is a, I'll, I'll stop here, and then we'll switch to the other group's projects. So, so another thing that we are really interested in is GP, GPU computing. So that's general purpose computing on graphics processors like NVIDIA. So unlike um, Intel processors, we can run about 16,000 and soon we'll run about 500,000 concurrent threads on these processors. But what we are really interested in is can we run, you know, algorithms that are any time algorithms. So most of the algorithms you all have programmed so far are run to completion. So if you do binary sort, then if you run the program till the end, it gives you one answer. But if you interrupt the program, it gives you no answer. Right? So these anytime algorithms are you give them the more time you give them, the better and better they get. So it's not machine learning, it's just that they are iterating and they are become they are giving you a more accurate answer. So what we are focused on over here is we have this very large simulation on Washington DC. So don't worry about the graphics. They're pretty crappy. They don't run on the GPU. We're only looking at the computation. So here we have about 800,000 cars driving through Washington, DC. And you can see it gets redder and redder. And that shows you where the congestion is forming. And so we are really looking at how do we do real-time traffic congestion prediction? How do we make sure that everyone gets the fastest path? You want to go to the airport. I want to go to Center City. You know, He wants to go to the closest bar. He gets across right, really fast. So we can run about 16 million cars on any of the maps across the US and run and do a lot of very, very interesting algorithms. And so all the research we focused on 
uh, uh, and we focus on right now is stuff that hasn't been done or that is just you know ramping up and will come in the industry in a couple of years. So I'll stop at this point and then you know I'll let Enkyung uh, and Krishna uh, take over and they can explain to you what they are focused on. Okay. Yeah, and if you have any questions, just ask. Yeah, I will just briefly explain. Yeah, our purpose is that make software safe. So to make the software safe, actually we are the using the formal method software engineering technology. And maybe you are not familiar with the formal method. It's mathematically based, very correct method we want to use for the proving and verifying the software is really safe. So using the, this pacemaker example, actually we model this the software in a, some formal model and then we really want to generate C code to automatically from the formal model and then we really want to trust on that the C code is really safe in timing aspect and also functional aspect. So this is just our the proposed approach to make the structure actually the implementation really safe from the modeling phase into the implementation phase. Yeah. So uh, I think just to just briefly explain our purpose and summary would be enough. So if you have any questions, so feel free to ask me. And then, yeah, let's go over to another topic. Mm -hmm. You can move the chairs up. So. Well, I work on a, uh, with, a, with another group, which is allied with this group. And this is kind of the project I'm working on. It's completely different from what you've heard so far. This is very cyber, cyber work. No, not much physical in that. And so the basic idea here is that you guys, when you took computer networks course in your undergrad, you must have heard about BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, which ISPs or what's called autonomous systems use to communicate with each other at very high level uh, view of the internet to like you know figure out where to route their packets. So Google has an autonomous system or basically a big router which says that all the IP addresses allocated to YouTube are owned by me and you should send this packets to me. Whoever wants to access YouTube should send this packet to my BGP uh, serve a router and then that will I will provide the data for you <coughs> so the problem with this system is that it's based on uh, you know it expects everybody to behave properly but the internet as you know uh, is not a very safe place so the idea here is to kind of try to build a notion of trust inside this uh, very high level interdomain routing uh, scenario or situation so what happens is that uh, many of the ISPs or many rogue ISPs or you know good ISPs with you know who don't have good programmers or you know system administrators what they do is that they sometimes due to bad scripting start claiming that they own all blocks of, I of IP addresses which belong to somebody else this is called prefix hijacking it happens routinely uh, once in a couple of months or even daily but for you know uh, not not it's not such a big deal but the problem is that sometimes when it really happens, uh, a lot of IP addresses get route, uh, get claimed by some ISP, and then all the internet traffic goes to that ISP instead of going to the right place. So, example, YouTube went offline in 2008 for like one hour because some ISP in Pakistan decided that they want to block YouTube because the government ordered them to, and they just basically said that we own all YouTube's IP addresses. So the whole world started sending their packets to, to Pakistan, and of course they were dropping everything. So, you know, YouTube went offline for one hour or two hours. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to build a service uh, which can basically find out how much you can trust uh, an ISP or an autonomous system uh, in, in terms of generating such invalid updates. So what we are doing is that basically we are trying to build a reputation system which basically looks at how different ISPs worked in the past and whether they you know, uh, hijacked prefixes or not. And based on that, we kind of create uh, a set of, uh, we give them points, if you will, or reputation values. And then you can pretty much track them uh, on a daily basis as to how they're performing now. So 
this was an, on April 8th, China Telecom hijacked the whole internet. They said that they own every IP address that exists on the planet, and everybody was really pissed off about it. So their reputation tanked that day, or basically, you know, it just went really, <coughs> just went down. And our system has been tracking them since that day, that they are the worst performers. And what we do is that we give them, like, you know, we, do, we kind of use a, a time decay function to map the reputations. So once your reputation tanks, it takes some time to heal, as long as you don't make more mistakes. So they, their reputation tanked to such an extent that it took them about a month and a half to get you know, back to normal. And they were consistently being shown as the worst uh, ISP on the planet, which was not really, which was, I mean, to some extent, it's, it, it makes sense because they, they screwed up so bad that, you know, you would be careful accepting any update messages from them saying that we own a particular prefix or IP address. So we basically have this service running online, and uh, the URL's here. If you guys are interested, or you can just, you know, contact me. And it'll show you the list of uh, IP of ISPs, how they're performing. But we go by autonomous systems. I wouldn't say ISP is a bit cruder version of saying the same thing. And how they're performing, how their reputations are, and whether you should be trusting the packets that they're, the updates that they're sending. So that's the pretty much the whole story. Okay. Yeah, so um, my book is um, about the company just now. Analysis for real-time embedded systems. So just to um, mention briefly why we need compositional analysis and what this exactly. So if you look at embedded systems nowadays, most of them are extremely complex. And uh, have anyone uh, ever opened the iPhones? So if you look at the chip inside the box, it actually consists of many different components from different vendors and all sitting inside the same board here. So it's, it's, it's very complex and heterogeneous. So uh, in order to build such a system, um, uh, one of the methods to uh, do that is to do comp component-based designs. Uh, what it means is that you have a big system, you break them into different components, and then you build each of these components independently, and you compose different components into a bigger components. And eventually, at the top level, you have the entire system. So in order to do that, uh, what we need to do is we have to ensure that uh, when the different vendors build these components, uh, it must be satisfied uh, all the different constraints of the whole system. So to do the analysis, we have to also break down the requirement into different smaller components, and that's why we need to have um, so if you have a component, you have to have an interface for that component. And when you compose different components, uh, actually different vendors will not know what exactly go inside each component. But what they know is the interface of the components. So we need to capture what are the requirements inside each of the interface. And we need to ensure that when we compose different interface, the, the larger interface will satisfy all the constraints. And uh, the method to do that is to do the compositional analysis. And in our, our lab, what we are concerned is more, more on the non-functional aspect, which means uh, the timing aspect, resource constraints, the criticality levels of the system. And for, for that resource constraints, uh, uh, basically we have the whole system, which uh, the resource allocation is, is like a tree-like manner in a big top level, you allocate resource into smaller components. But uh, in order to build that, what we need to do is from small different components, we need to determine what the resource needed for each of the small component. And then when we have different small components, when we try to combine them, they will be scheduled under some scheduling policies. And we, again, under this, we need to de determine what is the resource requirement for a bigger component. And the method to do that is uh, basically you break down into different steps. So first, you need to identify what the, the characteristic of the components, which is the component modeling, where we need to identify like what are the tasks running, how much resource it required. And then from those, we need to abstract it into us an interface. So if you have smaller components scheduled, we need to abstract into interface. And this interface basically just uh, say about uh, what are the resource requirement it needs so that this component will be always working properly. And then uh, you determine what are the representation for interface and then we compose different interface together. 
And so basically, graphically, these are the steps that are involved in, inside a compositional analysis framework. And one of the aspects that we focus on is, um, is in multi-mode systems. Uh, uh, the reason is because if you look at the airplane, it works uh, basically at different stages where first it's take off and then after a while it will go into a uh, normal cruise and then it will go to landing and sometimes if some events occur it may go to emergency. And we can kind of capture this as a multi-mode system where the system operates at different modes and in each mode it works differently, it performs a different task, different functionality. And to do that we use uh, some, an automaton and uh, is automaton will specify what are the different functionality that is involved in, in different modes and how they change from one mode to another. And from this, we again, we need to do the abstraction, which is also a compute and interface for this type automaton. And again, uh, uh, in order to do that, we use different techniques and we come up with like uh, an interface, also another automaton, which say what are the uh, different resource that you need for each different uh, conditions. Yeah, so uh, roughly this is what we do, and uh, we have also built a tool called CAST, which stands for Compositional Analysis of Real-Time Systems, uh, which allow you to compute what are the resource requirements to do the compositional analysis. Yeah, right, that's uh, about it, yeah, <laughs> thank you. You should clap for you. <laughs> so. So as you can see, there's a big spectrum of stuff, right? And and that's that's part of the fun that we can go from if you're in robotics and you know building stuff with your hands or like GPU computing or industrial control or like the theory side of things on you know formal methods or composition. So and and that's sort of the goal that we have, you know, for a lot of the programs here is that you don't be become a software engineer or a hardware engineer. The days of being that sort of narrow engineer are really numbered, right? You become a platform architect, but that means that you can do a good bit of the spectrum, that you can analyze and build a system from requirements and make sure that it will scale. And if you're building like the next generation avionics or medical system or you know any of these very large complex systems, you become the chief architect, right? But what you need to get there is a lot, lot of the program is really focused on that. So if you'll have questions, ask away. If you want to, all the, our website has all the videos I showed you. It's just mlab.cs.upen. So mlab is Embedded Systems Lab. And, uh, and you'll find you know, even a video tour of the lab. So, uh, so if you have any questions, stop, you know, ask away or shoot us an email or anything like that.